Have you ever read that little quotation that talks about different kinds of people? You know, you're a morning person, an evening person. It says, one person, the way you know the difference, it says you wake up in the morning and some people will get up and say, good morning, Lord. And the other person gets up and says, good Lord, morning. <laughs> right? Well, I, I had one of those experiences this past week. On Wednesday, I'm lying in bed and my mind is racing um, I just had some conversations with people who were going through some really difficult times and I must have, just must have been on my mind. So when I went to bed, I was kind of restless most of the night and then one day, and, and then I just like turned around and I looked at the clock and it was like 423. And you know, when those moments happen, you're not going to bed, right? So I just got up, I went downstairs and I thought, you know, I need to clear my head. So I put my sneakers on, I went out for a little walk and um, one of the things I do when I, when I find like my mind races like that, I, I just start saying out loud as many of the promises that I could remember that God has made to me. So I'm walking and the sun is just barely starting to come up. And um, I start thinking, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. There is nothing in all this world that could ever separate me from the life which is in Christ Jesus. I am, more through a con I am more than a conqueror through Christ who loved me. In him, I live and move and have my very being. And after a while, I kind of felt that heaviness just leave me. And by now the sun was up and I'm walking around, leaned over, took out my, my phone, put on some music. And then God started to speak to me. You've been through that Rooted series, right? And remember that one chapter where it says, how does God speak to us? And it talked about how God speaks to you through the word or God can speak to you through his spirit. God speaks to us through people and circumstances. Well, on this day, God chose to use a song by a young man named Forrest Frank. It was called A Good Day. I'm walking down the road and says, I'm about to have a good day, right? In every single way. The sun, the sun is shining down on me. The birds are singing praise. I'm about to have a good day, right? In every single way, right? The God who made the universe knows me by my name, so it's a good day. I'm like, yeah. Came back, feel no good. My wife just getting up, getting ready to leave by around 6.15, and she looks at me and she goes, what got into you? I'm like, I'm about to have a good day. You know, that's the mindset that I hope you have when you're reading through the book of 1 John. Now, I know there's a lot of really harsh things. I, I think that John was born in Brooklyn because he just comes right out and just says it. You're a liar. I'm like, whoa, he's toning it down. But um, underlying all of that is his sincere desire for you to have a good day. He wants you to, to really understand all that blessing that is yours. It's kind of like what I, when I wrote that little you know, uh, text to my, my boys. I, I'm really proud of them. I want them to succeed. I want them to live generous lives. I just don't want them to go get so caught up in, in stuff that they forget the one in who we live and move and have our very being. So I'm obnoxious. I'm always doing that. And they're like, dad, dad. And I'm like, don't dad me. <laughs> but um, we've been through two weeks already in this series. And I thought I would just put on the screen something that would just maybe capsulize uh, uh, what we've looked at already, just to give perhaps some of you who are just joining us this morning for the first time. So far in our study in 1 John, we've learned this in the first four verses, that Jesus, God's son, who was from the beginning, 
has now appeared in the flesh for the reason that we might have fellowship with God, experiencing a complete joy, inexpressible and full of glory. You realize that that's what John says in the very opening of his book, that everything he's going to talk to us about is so that that would happen, that we would have fellowship with God, that we would experience this joy. It says a complete joy, inexpressible, full of glory. And then he goes on and he says this. He begins to illuminate the path forward by reminding us, he says, sin destroys our fellowship with God creating a misalignment between our talk and our walk. It leaves us self-deceived instead of self-aware, clinging to my truth while replacing God's truth. See, the solution to that is the call to turn to Jesus for the forgiveness of our sin to restore our fellowship with him. So just like a good parent, John is speaking to this congregation and saying, listen, God wants to have this great fellowship with you, wants you to experience this joy, but what's gonna get in the way is this sin. If you don't deal with this problem, it's gonna deal with you. That's why he says, look, if you claim to have fellowship with God, and yet you walk in darkness, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. Think about that. Seriously, just pause on that for a moment because the, the scriptures are clear. John comes out and says, God is light and there is no darkness in him. So if I'm gonna claim to be walking with him, and yet my life is completely out of step, then don't you see you could be self-deceived? You could be replacing my truth with his. And then we wonder why we don't really experience the full joy of what it means to know Jesus. Because we're half-stepping it all along the way. Today, John's going to take us another step down this path. He wants, as we said in the overall theme of this series, is how is John going to illuminate the path forward for us? So I want you to sit back and listen as I read to you the first um, 14 verses from John chapter 2. It says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. The truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. 
I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. Fathers, because you have known who is from the beginning. Young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. So what I want to do is now just go back and revisit this text and find out another truth that John wants us to have so that we can walk in this light. So let's go back to verse three here. He says, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Uh, think of this as a spiritual test. You're sitting there now and your relationship with Jesus. Now, remind yourself that what we have talked about so far, there are texts, right? That it's not say, if we say we have not sinned, the truth is not in you. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So these texts aren't meant to talk about perfection. These texts are pointing out the, the course of one's life. The, the, the constant, you know, um, desire. Where, where is it? Is it really to serve God? Because if it is, it's going to move you to a place of repentance. It's going to be a time when you begin to look at what your heart is saying, what you feel like doing, and then you have God's word and what Jesus is promising, and you're like, oh, the things I would do, those I do not, and the things I shouldn't do, those I do. Who will rescue me from this bondage? And that's where the Spirit of God comes. And the Spirit of God comes and convicts us of sin and righteousness and judgment. The Spirit of God begins to say, hey, listen, you can take a walk on the wild side. In fact, I've called that the Broadway. Go ahead, man. Take a walk on the Broadway. It's filled with people. The only thing is, it leads to destruction. But this road... Its gate is a little narrow, but those who enter it, they find life and peace. Because there they'll find me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. And you've heard that message. And you've responded to that message. And it's a constant ongoing transformation that is taking place. That's why I kid around with people. I said, we're all a piece of work. You're never going to be perfectly holy, but we have to be chasing after it. And that's what this text is about. This is the test. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. One of his commands is that you confess your sins. So let's see how we do. And this, it goes on in verse four and it says, the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. So this is getting a failing grade because you can't just say with your lip, I love, I love Jesus, but everything about my life is saying the opposite. And I know we are in this environment. You're not supposed to judge anybody. I don't judge anybody's heart. I don't know what's in somebody's head. Hey, I've been married 42 years. I still don't know what's in hers. <laughs> Every once in a while, she wakes up and I'm looking like, where'd you come from? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what she says to me. <laughs> but you can inspect fruit, right? I don't know what's in a person's heart, but I can, I, I'm a fruit inspector. This text is telling you and me that if we say we know God, but don't do what he says, we're lying. And the truth is not in us. So this whole idea of 
life and lip having to be together. You know, it just doesn't call him a liar. Notice how he gives a little explanation. He says, the truth is not in you. That's a sobering, sobering word. Because sin could be so deceiving. If we're not careful, we're worshiping the God of our own imagination rather than the God that has revealed himself in his scripture. So he goes on and he says this in verses five and six. He says, if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. See, that's the passing grade. It begins saying that I'm, I'm taking this word seriously enough to try to conform my life more and more into what it's saying. And after all, what is it saying? I, I know, listen, I've been at this for a very long time and I can say unequivocally that sometimes churches could be very judgmental. I, I, I get it. I listen to Christians sometimes and they go off on the, on the, uh, on the non-essentials. I still remember I was a new Christian and I went to visit uh, a friend of mine's church and I walked in and there was a very pleasant, you know, senior lady there and I walked in and the first thing she did was pull out a track, give me this track and the track was all about how any other Bible than the King James Bible is false. And I was just a new Christian at the time and I'm sitting there looking at her like, you gotta be kidding me. That was the first touch that that church had with me. And I get it. Sometimes I just shake my head and I think, oh man, we could do so much better than that. But I also experienced the church in its glory. People who will go that second mile, turn that other cheek, give the shirt off their back. People who will pray and give and work But this text here is saying that if we just seek to obey that word, do you notice that there's a benefit that comes with that? The text is saying to you and me that love is going to be made complete. In fact, that word love appears, it says uh, in, the, in the Gospel of John, it appears 18 times in just five chapters. It's the most out of any of the New Testament books. So while all this language comes across really hard, it's coming from a place where, where John's just trying to woo them back to make sure that they're not falling prey to being self-deceived. He wants them to experience this love that is complete. And he knows that the way to experience that is through obedience. That obedience is going to have a positive impact on one's life. Obedience is this path to experiencing God's love. Jesus would tell his disciples this in John 15. He says, this is how we know we are in him. We have to walk like Jesus walked. So this isn't a new command. Think about it. How did Jesus walk? Okay, we all know he was perfectly, but this text, come on, already we know he's not saying that we're gonna be perfect. He already says, if anybody says he has not sinned or he has no sin, the truth is not in him. What he is saying, though, is that what is at the core of your decision-making? Is it gonna be you? Or am I gonna submit to his will? And I'm not talking about these non-essentials. I'm talking about those great truths that are pronounced here in the scripture. That it says Jesus is our advocate. The one who has given his life a ransom for your sins and mine. And not only for us, it says for the whole world. Jesus came and he did the will of his father. 
Jesus said, you look at me, you understand the Father. So let's apply that to you and me. If we say that we're Christians, if people looked at you, would they say, oh, that's a reflection of Jesus? See, we like the grace part. God forgives 70 times seven. But this is also in the Bible. Saying that you and I have to take God's word seriously enough that it begins to be incorporated into my life. It has to be seen in the way in which I live, not just the way I think. Because in my head, I'm 200 pounds. I get on the scale to be continued. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> One at a time, please. <laughs> There's nothing new here. Which is what he goes on to say. Look at verse 7 and 8. He says, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. So he goes on, he says this, he says, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. See, there's nothing new about this. Nothing. Nothing new about this test that he is, that he is giving to you and me. The message, he says, is something that you've already heard because God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the truth is to have an observable impact on our life. People ought to see the darkness is passing and the true light is beginning to shine. If you get nothing else out of what I'm sharing with you this morning, I hope it's this, that if you say that you're going to walk in the light, it has to be seen in the way in which you live. They have to be in sync. Look at 9 through 11. It says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. See, what I, what I think is happening here now is that the Apostle John has already given us the test if you say you walk in him, then you keep his word. That's the test. Now you and I have to sit down and think about one's life. We have to live an examined life. And then what John does now is he says, I want to give you a clear-cut example. And this is the example he gives. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. See, this is the truth that is now being applied. But come on, isn't it easier to love God whom you have not seen than to love a brother whom you have? That's easy. I could go around and memorize all the verses. I could have all the songs. It's a good day, right? And yet, I hate my brother. I want God to love me. I pray for my brother. But I pray that the building might fall on him or the, get hit by a car, right? Like, well, what's that? You see now how all of a sudden this thing is no longer theoretical. This is just not a theological, you know, statement. This is now a very practical statement. It is calling us to live as Jesus lived. 
Jesus walked around with sinners, tax collectors. He didn't walk around them to become like them. He, he, he walked around them so that he would have an influence in their life, bringing them to a place where they no longer have to be overcome by the things of this world, but that they could be set free. The stresses, the anxieties, everything that comes, God's saying there is a better way. But you're not going to talk your way into it. You're going to have to live your way into it. And that's why sometimes you look at the church in the days in which we're living, and it is, it, it's anemic. It's because we want to have the show of religion, but we're not willing to put the hard work in. But when you put in the hard work, and I've seen it here, It's a reason why, like in New Hampshire, the average church is about 35. Look around, the fruit that we have is because of you. Because you are seeking to walk in the light. And we're not perfect, but we're not deluding ourselves. That's the goal, disciples making disciples. So when I read this text, hating your brother is seen as being in darkness. To do the opposite is to walk in the light. Love lives in the light. The darkness is blinding. It causes me to stumble, to lose my way. Why would I choose the darkness? It only appears easier. Just give it a little bit more time and then see how all of the repercussions of those decisions wind up mounting up in your life until the things that you thought were so cool, now you regret. And why wait? Why not open up your life right now and just say, Jesus, I believe that you have the best in mind for me. So I'm going to let you define for me what is righteous, what is good, what is true, what is noble. And in those moments when you and I are going at it, I'm going to pray really hard that your will, not mine, would be done. And you watch what God does in your life. What a practical practical test to use in our daily life. I want you to think about that with me. This is such a practical test. If I am walking in darkness, it means that I am engaged in activity that God definitely has said, this is off limits. If I am doing that, then what is it saying about where my head and my heart and my hands and my feet are in that moment? That ought to be an opportunity then for us to sit back and repent. Repentance is a good word. It's a do-over. God is quick to listen. He says that whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. That way it's never too late. He says you will seek me and find me if you seek for me with all of your heart. So no matter where it is, what we've done, the path is always the same. Say yes to Jesus. Just start taking his word more seriously. And you see how he begins to navigate you out of that darkness. So having said that, I want to end my sermon by just reading to you a passage from Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, there is a juxtaposition between the acts of this flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And it goes on to talk about what the acts of the flesh are, which are the acts of darkness. It's not a, come on, it's not an exhausted list, but the, 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 you know, Paul is writing to the Galatian church and just giving them a heads up that this is what it means to walk in darkness over against the fruit of God's Spirit in your life. 
So if this truly is the truth applied, if you and I leaving today understand that if we say that I know him, that I have to obey the truth, then here's a little bit more of a way to take a look at one's own life and see where it is that I'm standing. Now what I did, because sometimes you'll read words like debauchery, and you wonder like, Okay, I think I kind of know what that means, but there's a, a version of the Bible out. It's called um, The Message. It's written by James Peterson. What he did was he took these expressions and he put them in a common vocabulary. So what I did was I am going to put them up on the screen and then in parentheses, in all caps, I put what the word is that you would find in, in a version like the New International Version that is more of a word-for-word -word translation than a paraphrase. It'll become obvious as I start. It starts off this way in Galatians 5, 19. It says, it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, sexual immorality. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Impurity. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Debauchery. Trinket gods. Idolatry. Magic show religion. Witchcraft. Paranoid loneliness. Hatred. Cutthroat competition discord, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, jealousy, a brutal temper, fits of rage, an impetus to love or be loved, selfish ambition, divided homes, divided lives, dissensions, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, factions, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Envy. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Drunkenness. Ugly parodies of community. Orgies. I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you. You know if you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's sobering, right? If you walk in the light, you walk in love, which means that you know him. So what does that look like? Contrast the list before with the fruit that comes when we walk in the spirit, when we walk in this light. Peterson goes on and says, but what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, love, exuberance about life, joy, serenity, peace. We develop a willingness to stick with things, patience, a sense of compassion in the heart, kindness, a conviction that basic holiness permeates things and people, goodness. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, faithfulness, not needing to force our way in life, gentleness, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely, self-control. Were we not told that Jesus would be our advocate? His desire is for us to step out of the darkness and to walk in the light, to experience this fellowship, to have this joy in us made complete. Because in the end, this is what it's about, to, to live in love is to walk in in the light. Love and light have to go together. 
We may separate it in our own heads, but not according to the scripture. If you claim to know him, but walk in the darkness, the truth is not in you. What a great call for each and every one of us to decide, I'm gonna fix my eyes on Jesus. I might have to start with baby steps, but eventually I'm gonna grow into a mature young woman. I'm going to go out into this world And I'm going to let this light shine. And suddenly those chains that oftentimes hold people down, you see them set free. I never tire of proclaiming that message. But I also have to remind myself that it's not enough to say good things. I have to live in the light. How about if we just covenant to do that together? How about if Bethany Church just continues on this journey to bear with one another, to love one another, to encourage one another? How about that? Amen?